Okay, so this is going to be a derivation of the Bohr model. Um, uh, those of you guys who, uh, I mean, you've been in this class for a while, you know that I don't actually like spend a lot of time on derivations. I will say that this, uh, the, the derivation of this model is one of the most important uh, ones that you'll see, both because um, it's a, a very uh, um, important one in history in that it basically set up a lot of quantum mechanics and what people understood from quantum mechanics, but it also is because it's something that's super accessible. It's something that you as students can do right now. And actually, it's one of the few ones I'm going to ask you to actually learn how to do so you can actually get it. Um, basically, the idea is we're finally trying to actually deal with a, an atom. So we're actually trying to predict the actual structure of an atom from quantum mechanics. Um, and so we start with something really simple. We start with um, a proton in the middle. All right. And then it's surrounded by... An electron. And there are a couple things about the Bohr model. Um, so this is an electron. Um, there are a couple things that it assumes, uh, and we'll, we'll talk through the way about, about these different assumptions. Um, the first thing uh, is that we assume um, the electron orbits in a play. And we also assume that it's a circle. So we assume that the electron is basically doing exactly what I show right here, which is that it's circling around the proton in a circle, just like a planet goes around the sun, all right? Um, it turns out this actually isn't a great model. Uh, um, uh, first of all, the electron actually moves in three dimensions. Um, and also, uh, um, it, it isn't a, a circle that, that but, it turns out that despite the fact that, okay, this isn't a perfect model, it turns out that um, a lot of the things that you get just from assuming this state actually gets you the right, uh, some really interesting answers, in particular gets you the right energies, uh, which is kind of amazing. It also gets at the actual weirdness of the quantum uh, nature of this model, which is kind of the most important thing. So the third one is a really important one. We're going to actually treat the electron as a wave, okay? Um, and since the electron's a wave, there's something really important that has to happen, which is that if we imagine the electron being a wave, um, I'm going to see if I can do this. Um, one thing that you know has to be true, oh my goodness, am I going to do it, is that as this thing comes around, we need, oh, I screwed it up. Well, so we can't have happen what just happened. Do you see that right there? I'm having the part of the wave kind of destructively interfere with itself. Um, that's what we're saying is not going to have, <laughs> that cannot have happen. What we're saying is that when the electron goes around, um, it has to constructively interfere with itself so that we basically just get one nice continuous wave there. Okay, I, I know I kind of mucked up, but it's, it's close enough. So we're saying that, um, uh, the, the electron, oops, um, the, the wave function of the electron has to match itself or constructively interfere um, when it goes the whole way around. And this is, it turns out, it seems like a really straightforward thing. Like you just say, okay, fine. The thing has to like, like meet itself whenever it goes around. It turns out almost all the quantum mechanics actually comes from this. Um, this gives us actually just one equation, which is that it says that, um, uh, so going the whole way around, if you remember, if there's if uh, if the electrons at a radius of r, you know that going the whole way around means going a distance of two pi r. All right, so that's that's just the that's um, the the uh, circumference of a circle. Um, and what we're saying, the fact that it needs to match itself when it goes the whole way around, we mean that it has to in when it goes the whole way around, it has to have some integer number of wavelengths. Um, when it goes around and that's all we're saying that's the whole thing but it turns out that this equation i'm going to put in a, a red box it's so important 
Um, this equation, it turns out, is going to be absolutely vital to the rest of this derivation. Uh, but we're actually going to um, uh, we're actually going to leave it behind for now. Um, what we're going to do now is we're actually going to just assume that we can keep doing uh, classical physics. So uh, let's talk about what's happening whenever we have an electron and a proton. Well, what's the thing that's holding them together? Well, the thing that's holding them together is that the proton has a positive charge and the electron has a negative charge, all right? And they're interacting electrostatically. So the force between the two of them is just going to be Coulomb's force, all right? Which it turns out is just K times E squared over R squared. That is the electrostatic force between uh, two charges. There's actually a negative that goes in it, but we're not gonna worry about that right now. The, the directions of forces um, are a little bit uh, uh, are a little bit funny. So for right now, let's just let's just call it the absolute value of the force. Um, and and if you're worried about the the sign of it, we'll talk about it later. But so it's just k, which is just the electrostatic constant times e squared, where e is the charge of an electron, um, and r is just the distance between basically that proton and that electron. Okay, and that is the electrostatic force. Now the whole thing is moving in a circle. So if you remember, so f the force of anything is equal to mass times acceleration. But if you remember, if it's moving in a circle, you remember that acceleration, okay, is equal to V squared over R. If we remember that centripetal acceleration, sorry, I lost my M, that's a V squared over R. Okay, well, so the great news is that the only thing that's causing acceleration is this thing, so we can actually equate those two. We, so we can say MV squared over R is equal to K e squared over r squared. Now that doesn't look that uh, that interesting, but whenever you multiply both sides by m r, okay, uh, what you're going to get is that these r's are going to cancel out. You're going to get um, an m squared, and so you're going to get an m squared v squared is equal to uh, one of those r's is going to be canceling out. Um, so we're going to get m k e squared over r. Um, the neat thing about m squared v squared is that's actually the same as momentum squared. If you take m, one of those mv's together, um, you can just call that momentum squared. That's just the absolute value of momentum squared. Um, okay, uh, well, um, that may not be super interesting to you, uh, but uh, if you remember, um, we have already a relationship um, for that relates momentum to wavelength. Okay, uh, if you remember, remember that guy who's hard to pronounce, De Broglie. Nope, nope, it's an L-E. All right, and De Broglie said, right, that momentum is equal to h over lambda. This is also a really important equation because this is the second time that we brought in quantum mechanics. All the rest of it, only the thing, the two things that are boxed are actually quantum mechanics. The rest of this is just normal, normal mechanics. So if we plug this in, whoops, if we plug this in here, uh, what we're gonna get is we're gonna get h squared over lambda squared, because it's momentum squared, is equal to and we'll just do the thing on the right, m k e squared over r. We have, uh, so now that we have that, uh, the, this lambda squared here, um, what we're going to do is we're actually going to plug in this equation that we had the whole way up here down into there. So we're gonna get an h squared, and then we're going to get a two pi r over n, all right, squared, and that's going to equal m k e squared over r. All right, and now again, we'll just kind of simplify this a bit. Um, we're going to get an n squared h squared over two uh, um, over four pi squared um, r squared is equal to m k epsilon squared over r. Excellent. Um, so now we can uh, go ahead and start cancel some things out. We get an R that cancels out right here. Um, uh, I'm not going to do what your book does. Your book actually changes this K uh, into a four pi, a one over four pi epsilon. Not, let's not worry about that right now. Let's just try to solve for the rest of this. 
r is going to go over here so we get that r is equal to um, we're going to get n squared a squared over 4 pi squared um, m k e squared so we get something that looks like this um, it doesn't actually really matter that i have slightly different units than they do um, uh, what this actually is in both cases is um, if we write this, we can write this in a in a special way where, where we can basically say, okay, let's take h squared over 4 pi squared m k e squared, and let's separate that out from the n squared. Now what we're going to have is that whenever, whenever I set n equal to 1, so when r is n equal to 1, this just equals this thing right there. Okay, um, so in other words, n is equal to 1, so that just is, what that is, that's just the smallest radius that you can have. Again, what we have, again, that's shown up just like we did when we did our quantum, our other quantum models, is we now have um, that the, the electron is only allowed to be at certain radiuses, or radii. Um, there's only certain places that uh, the thing is allowed to to um, to, to go around the, uh, the, the proton in. And so we have these quantized radii. Um, this first one, if you actually do that calculation, this is just equal to 0 0.053 nanometers. And so we can just write our R uh, as uh, uh, um, can be basically anything. Uh, it's 0 0.053 nm to the n squared. So basically this is, this thing is that right there, and that's what it is in nanometers. And so if you want to know what radius you're at, you just plug in n equals 1, n equals 2, n equals 3, and then just multiply it by 0, 5, 3, and that tells us where the actual thing is. So that's actually our first result, is that actually we have these quantized radii. Um, it can the, small, the closest it can get to the proton is 0 0.053 nanometers, and then it goes away in quantized amounts uh, if you just plug in n equals 1, 2, 3, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. All right, so that's the first thing. The second thing we're going to be interested in is what the actual energies are. Now, if you remember, energy is just equal to one half mv squared, uh, such so as kinetic energy plus potential energy. Um, that's just the equation for energy, which you should have remembered from uh, from your E, uh, um, from uh, sorry, from your C book, your conservation book. Um, it turns out the potential of a um, of uh, and uh, of an electron and a proton interacting together um, is just oops sorry um, is just e squared over four pi epsilon naught um, r. Uh, let's write that using the same units that 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 we used before. It's actually k e e squared over um, over r. Okay. Uh, and so we can go ahead and plug that in. Uh, sorry, it's minus k e squared over r. So we can plug that in, and we get that the e is equal to one half mv squared minus k e squared over r. Now it looks like we're kind of done there, and we're not going to be able to do too much more, except that if you, because we don't really know what the velocity, what m times v is, so we don't really know what this is. Uh, but if you look up here, actually, uh, way back here, we found. And I'll just circle this in a uh, in a different color. Or actually, let's I can even highlight it. Um, we found that m v m squared v squared this right here. We found that it's equal to this, and it turns out we can basically plug that in down here with some fancy stuff. So if we know that, if we know that, let's just do an aside. Um, we know that m squared v squared, where is it? Is equal to m, m, m k e squared over r. Uh, then if we actually just divide this by 2m, so divide this by 2m, divide this by 2m, we get 1 half m v squared is equal to, these m's are going to cancel out, k e squared 
over 2r. All right, and so we can actually plug that back in over here to the 1 half mv squared. So plug that in right here. And we get that the total energy is just equal to ke squared over r, 1 half ke squared over r, minus ke squared over r. Um, you notice those are the same terms. We just get 1 half of something minus 1 of something. So this is just going to give us minus 1 half ke squared over r. But the cool thing is, is we've actually already found what, the, what r is. It turns out that r is just equal to, um, so we just get ke squared over 2 times, we're going to call this thing up here, we're just going to call it a naught, and that just means the smallest radius that we can have. So it's just 2 times a naught times n squared. And that is the energies. Um, it turns out the energies are also quantized. They go as 1 over n squared. And the nice thing is you can just calculate, again, like we did before, you can just calculate everything except for the n squared. And what you get, that this is minus 13.6 eV, and then you have it divided by n squared. Okay? And that's the big result. Um, your book is going to write these energies a little bit different. So your, your book writes this equation. Um, uh, he writes it, this equation as En is equal to uh, minus E squared over 8 pi epsilon naught A naught um, N squared. Uh, but again, the only thing that's different is that he's just defining K. He's, it's the difference between defining K versus 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught. It doesn't really make a difference. The really important thing is that this basically tells us our energy and it tells us that we can calculate all the different energies. And instead of making a separate movie, I'm just going to kind of finish that out. So I'm going to just finish this out by saying that, okay, um, we're going to uh, go ahead and just look at some different things. So um, let's do the first energy. The first energy is just equal to minus 13.6 EV divided by 1 squared. So that's just minus 13.6 EV. We can do the second energy. That's just minus 13.6 EV divided by 2 squared. So divide by 4, which is minus, I can never remember, something like 4 point something. So, um, so that's equal to minus 3.4 EV. And you can just keep doing that for all of them. And now you know all the energies of the hydrogen atom. Again, the crazy thing about this is that we basically taken the, hyd the hydrogen atom and it, the only thing that we've assumed okay the only kind of the only kind of crazy thing we've done we've done two weird things one is we've assumed that 2 pi r is equal to n, n lambda basically we assume that this thing constructively interferes with itself when it goes the whole way around um, and we've used the de, de Broglie relation that we talked that we talked about earlier all of the rest of it is just normal like straightforward mechanics and and you know obviously a lot of math but using all that math we are able to get the absolute energies of the the hydrogen atom and it turns out these are actually the real energies of the hydrogen atom despite all the issues that this um that the Bohr model has it actually predicted the right energies and even more importantly it predicted that the energies are quantized again the crazy thing is a hydrogen atom is not allowed to be in any energy it wants to be it has energy levels it has specific energies that it's allowed to be at and it's not allowed to be at those other energies you will never find a hydrogen atom to be at minus 10.3 eV because that isn't one of the allowed energies and that's the crazy thing about this model and it turns out this has huge predictions for and and consequences for what we see whenever we actually look at hydrogen atoms or any atoms and actually helps to explain the actual periodic table eventually and that's why this is such an important model so i hope that was useful um uh, if you have any questions you go ahead and post them in the slack channel or something like that um, and I uh, uh, hope to see you all soon.